Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, God, I just thank you that you are the God that is with us. You are Emmanuel. I thank you, God, that you have given us a mission. There is one person in this room who doesn't have a purpose in their lives. Thank you, God, because we are your children. We are your helpers. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. I just pray that um, as we transition into the Word, I just pray that, God, that we would know you more when we leave this place today than we know you right now. Would you come and encounter us, Father? Teach us, Lord. We want to know your ways. Teach us in your ways. Fill us with your courage. Arm us with your joy, God. We We want to know you, Father. We want to be just like you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. I absolutely love it when what you're speaking about like is just through the whole worship. I love that so much and it's like totally not planned. You just go, God just knows what he's doing, doesn't he? So good. Um, well, thank you guys for the, uh, for the lovely welcome before. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to thank all of you for being such a, um, a soft place for me to land. Um, I've been living out of Australia for the last 10 years. And um, so coming back in the middle of a pandemic, you know, being put in detention when I first got into the country, gosh, that was an experience. Um, and, and then I found my way here. Um, I went to a ministry school with Beth and she was the one person that I knew in, Tas- in Tasmania. And, um, and it's just been the most incredible um, experience coming into this house. And I can honestly say that I've experienced it as a place of grace. I feel like um, I've never quite been welcomed so fully into um, a house of believers so quickly. Um, you know, and I've learnt new skills, Russell down the back, great teacher, taught me how to do the words. Um, and I've absolutely loved it. I've loved, um, you know, being here. And um, got some very special visitors today. My family, so my amazing nan and my cousin and my friend. Um, so very excited to have them here this morning. They'll be horrified that I've pointed them out. <laughs> Now, um, this sermon is very much a get-to-know-you sermon, um, since so most of you don't know me very well. Um, and it's very, I just want to invite you on, on my journey um, of how God kind of um, equipped me. And, uh, and I, became, I went from being like a Christian to being a disciple, uh, which, is, which was quite a transition in my life. And... Um, yeah, and I'm very excited about the, the hub that's going to be happening on Wednesday nights. This whole idea of like, I just love Scott and Andrea's hearts. Um, just going after equipping everyone here. And um, yeah, so that just inspired this talk today. And I'm going to be talking about living naturally, supernaturally. And what does that actually mean? Good question. Uh, So basically, how do we live out our everyday lives whilst whilst carrying out the great commission of Jesus to go into all of the world and bring the good news to everybody that we meet? How do we actually do that? Um, So I am actually originally a Tassie girl. I I was born in Devonport and my parents were pastors on the northwest coast of Tasmania back in the 80s. And um, so it actually feels quite emotional to be here speaking to you today. Um, you know, I feel like God does a lot of, you know, like full circles in our lives through the generations. And I feel like today is definitely one of them. Back then, I hated going to church. Uh, <laughs> nothing more boring. Um, but when I was 23, 
I had a, a massive encounter that totally changed my life forever. And God went from honestly being a far away, boring idea, an angry God, to being the God who saved my life, rescued me from destruction, rescued me from death, and, and just got down in all my mess. And, you know, was my friend, my absolute companion that just championed me every single moment of every day and, and just walked with me into, into health and, um, and into restoration. And um, anyway, so, so after I had this, this life-changing encounter, I was like, I, w- I want to get to know this God. I want to get to know him in a way that, um, th- that, I, that I really know him because I've, you know, the thing is when you grow up as a pastor's kid, get a bit inoculated by all of the, you know, all the stories, you know, all the preaching, you know, all the songs to the, um, to the, to the worship, you know, all the lyrics to the worship songs, but um, it can, can all be head knowledge and not heart knowledge. And as soon as I had that drop for me and the songs became real, the words became real and actually a reflection of my own heart, I just kind of went on this quest to know this God. And so um, I I spent about three years on on my initial quest. And the first year, God really met me in my mess. He loved me unconditionally, even when I kept on stuffing up. And, um, And then in that second year, he really came in and healed me, transformed me, really set me free. And all of this is an amazing story that we're not going to talk about today, but for another time. And, um, and then I had this fire just sort of just, just come alive inside of me. And um, at the time, I was a real estate agent um, in Melbourne. So this is like many, many years ago. And, um, and I would go between appointments and I would have my worship music on full blast and I would be crying, crying, like just literally crying out to God, saying, I want to see signs, wonders and miracles. In Mark, Mark 16, 17, it says that signs, wonders and miracles follow those who believe. And honestly, like I started to get to know this God and I just realised that everything he says is actually true. And so I thought, like, I want to see the stuff. Like, I want to be involved. I want to, I, you know, I don't just want to be coming to church on Sunday. I actually want to see God move around me and through my life. I actually want to see that happen. And um, anyway, so after a year of crying out to God for signs, to see signs, wonders and miracles in my life, I was visiting my mum and I was coming back to Melbourne and I was sitting on the train, it was about a two hour journey. And I just, I had my window seat, which is always my favourite seat. And I was just like, I'm just gonna sit here and just enjoy the peace of the train journey. And um, anyway, God said to me about 15 minutes into this two hour journey, Georgia, I want to speak to the woman sitting next to you. What? And I was like, okay. I was like, far out, God is speaking to me. And I was like, okay, God, what do you want to say? And he said to me, Georgia, I want to speak to the woman sitting next to you. I was like, I got that, God. Got that. What do you want to say? And he said to me, Georgia, I want to speak to the woman sitting next to you. This went on for two hours, like literally for the rest of the journey. And by the time we pulled up um, in what was it, Spencer Street Station or whatever the station is, I was sweating, very uncomfortable. And I'd just been on this whole like, like cycle in my mind of like, of feeling paralyzed. Like I can't speak, I can't say anything. God has asked me to speak to this woman and I don't know how to and she's sitting there. And anyway, it got to, it got to the end and she went to, to get up and leave like a normal person at the end of the trip. And, and I just sort of, I grabbed 
I, I just sort of grabbed out to her and like held onto the cuff of her sleeve and she just stood back for me and she was like, um, and I just said, have a really nice day. <laughs> like a total fail. <laughs> and um, anyway, I got off the train and I just stood there and I was just like, God, my, this was my, literally my prayer. God, would you help me get my faith from the inside of me to the outside, to the outside world. Would you help me? Because I know that I can hear you and I know that you're real, but I don't know how to communicate that to, to I don't, you know, if you prompt me, I have no idea what to do. And um, what I didn't actually realize I was asking God to do was I was asking him to activate my faith. I was asking him to, um, to put my faith into action. And, and in, in James, uh, where is it? In James chapter 2, 17, he says, faith without works is dead. And this is, this is the natural um, progression of faith for a believer. We have an encounter with our incredible saviour who saves us, sets us free, restores us, and then we go on and we tell people about it. Like that is the progression of faith. And it, it's, it's a verb, it's a doing word, it's an action. It's not meant to be passive or a, a label that says, I am a Christian now. No, it's like I am a soldier now. I am going out, I am going out in the world to tell people what God has done for me. And um, anyway, so then after that, I entered my very awkward journey into living naturally, supernaturally. And um, so a few months after that, I went to a school in California. Um, it was the biggest thing I'd ever done. I'd never left Australia. I was 26, I had no money. Um, massive faith journey um, to go off and to study um, at this ministry school. And anyway, I had been at this school for about two days when I saw the most extraordinary thing I had ever seen. Um, it was at the end of class, there was this guy and, um, and he was praying for this woman with the expectation that something was going to happen. I could not believe it. I couldn't, he was actually praying for her, she was praying for her legs, like something was going to actually change in that moment as he was praying. And I gotta tell you guys, I was super offended. <laughs> super offended. I was just like, who is this guy? And just like, the audacity that he has, that he thinks that he can pray and God is going to show up. Honestly, I was so offended. And um, <laughs> you can see how this is going to go. And anyway, and I was offended, but I was captivated. It was like something with, that you're totally judging, but you can't stop watching. And um, anyway, I watched this guy, and, and he prayed past what was comfortable. You know how you kind of, when you're praying for someone, you pray for a certain amount of time, and then you go, and nothing happens, and then you just go, okay, in Jesus' name, amen, and you just move on. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. And he prayed for this woman for like 25 minutes, which is a long, that, that might not sound like a long time, but actually praying for someone, that is a long time. I was watching the whole thing. And um, anyway, as I was watching him, I really observed the look in his eye. It wasn't arrogance, it was compassion. And he wasn't staying there on his knees praying for this woman for such a long time because he wanted to, to prove that he could heal someone or it, it, it wasn't an arrogant thing. It, he was there on his knees in absolute compassion. And as I watched this, this sort of religious <laughs> mindset and judgmental mindset just broke off me. And I realized that what I was watching was the heart of God. That this man, that he had the heart of God. And I just, I stood there and I just repented. And I was just like, God, like, I want to be your ambassador 
like this. I want to bring people into an encounter with your love and healing the way that this guy is. I want to know you the way that he knows you. And, and, and honestly, from that moment, my life was completely and utterly changed. Um, where God had been real for me, I was able to, to bring a real God to others. And um, it's really interesting because, and I would say this, that if ever you get offended by something, like that is a moment for um, self-reflection and examination. I think that definitely in our culture at the moment, <laughs> it's like we get offended and then it's like, if offense, if we're just walking along our lives and we trip over a rock and offense is the rock and in, in the culture that we're in, we go, oh, I'm entitled to this rock because I found it and it is mine and it is a part of me. And that's definitely the way my relationship used to be with offense. But now I, I realize in that moment, oh my gosh, offense is like a red flag that actually I'm not going in the right direction that there's actually something in me that is holding onto a lie. And, and I found that um, it's actually impossible to get offended unless you're believing a lie. Because you can see something that you don't agree with or whatever it is, and, um, but you only get offended if you're believing a lie. And that day, the lie that I was believing was that because God is sovereign, it means that we can't partner with him. That because God is sovereign, we don't have any authority. That there is a great divide and that, you know, God sometimes chooses who he heals, but it's a mystery to us. And what I didn't realize is God is like, green light, go. And he's waiting for his army to go out and fight for his kingdom to come. That's why Jesus said, he said, I'm gonna teach you how to pray. Pray for my kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. There isn't any sickness in heaven, guys. And um, yeah, so if ever you find yourself offended, and even just on a daily basis, I, I always, I basically use offense as a roadmap to freedom in my life. So anytime I feel myself being offended, I'll just like, you know, whether it's I'm in the car or, you know, wherever I am, I just put my hand on my heart and like, Jesus, what lie am I believing right now? And it can be about something completely unrelated. Yeah. But this is the great thing about fence, is that we can turn it around and use it as our weapon. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in the next, um, the next few years, I saw the most radical signs, wonders, and miracles. Um, blind eyes open. I saw a guy get out of a wheelchair who'd been bound in a wheelchair, paralyzed for years. Um, a tumor the size of my hand dissolve in front of my eyes. Um, and there was, I mean, this whole experience ch drastically changed the trajectory of my life. And I was like, there's no way I can go back to being normal. You know, I can't, I can't go back to, you know, a nine to five job where I'm going to church on Sunday. I, this has to be a part of my everyday life. And um, about a year after, um, after finishing ministry school, I um, had been in London. So I went from America to London and been there for about six months. And I got a job as a receptionist at the Shard which is a beautiful building. It's the tallest building in London. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I just went, I was in my, just got into my 30s and it was like a really entry level position, but I was just like, do you know what? I've been doing ministry for the last couple of years and I just need a bit of a break. <laughs> I wanna go and have a fun job. And um, so I started working for this company of about, that had about 150 employees um, at the Shard. And, um, I, I went in there and I was like, God, I want to be on mission in this place. Like, I don't want to just see the signs, wonders and miracles when I'm out you know, on missions trips and at a ministry school. You are the same God that is with me right now. And so I have an expectation to see you in my nine to five job. 
And um, and when I when I got to that um, when I got to that uh, that job, they handed me a job description. Um, but God also handed me a job description, <laughs> and He handed me Isaiah 61. Uh, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Um, I honestly, I have never worked anywhere that was darker than this company. It was a sales company, and honestly, it was like one step from Sodom and Gomorrah. It was, it was full of just like hedonistic lifestyle, drugs, abuse, alcohol. I mean, the whole culture was super toxic. And um, anyway, and I, but I had this job description, and I had this job description to go and proclaim the, year, the Lord of the years, uh, the, the year of the Lord's favor to the prisoners. And these people were prisoners. They were bound up in this lifestyle that was really like sucking the life out of them. And um, anyway, so I kind of went in there and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to go. I love sneaking into places and, um, you know, just having like a little, you know, a mission from God that nobody knows about. And uh, I like to keep the fact that I'm a Christian just a, a secret for as long as I can. Because um, it can really go under the radar when people don't know. And um, anyway, <laughs> I was, I, I, so I started to do little things. I was just like, God, what can I do? And so every morning I would send out a word of the day, you know, to all the employees and be like, good morning, here's the word of the day. And it would be like an Audrey Hepburn quote, like, even the word impossible says, I'm possible. You know, just random stuff, you know. And um, this one day, um, I sent out a testimony of something that had happened in a team. And I said, I said, I want to release that over all of your teams. Um, anyway, there was this guy who I knew was a Christian. And because he was very loud and proud about being a Christian. And anyway, he came out to reception and he was like, I've just read your word of the day. And I've decided that you're either a witch or a Christian. <laughs> and I was like, what are you going to put your money on? <laughs> anyway, and he was just like, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I'm like, yes, I'm a Christian. And anyway, and so he was like, oh, mate, this place is so dry. There is like, pe I have invited 50 people here to church and no one ever comes. And he's like, I'm just, you know, going out there every day and telling people about getting, trying to get people to Alpha and trying to get people to Sunday. And, and I was like, oh, you know, like, this isn't working. Like, you know, um, and I said to him, I was like, well, what do you think about sort of, you know, bringing Jesus to them? Yeah. You know, if, if they're not coming to church, how about we bring Jesus to them? And he was like, oh, I don't have faith for that. <laughs> He was like, but honestly, I was so moved by him because he was, he had real faith for the anointing in his church, um, which I did definitely not have at the time. And um, yeah, so, so he was like respect, 100%. Anyway, um, so, so I just started to do little things like remembering people's names, welcoming them into work every morning. Um, and people started to notice there is something different about her. And, you know, just, I mean, th the most ridiculous things, like just smiling at someone or helping them out or just going that little bit further when it comes to, um, when it came to sort of helping them out in their everyday, their everyday lives. And, um, and I did that and I responded to prompts. Now, everybody gets prompts from God all the time. This is just the way that we're made. And looking back on my life, like I remember being in the playground at school and having prompts to go and speak to a kid who doesn't have any friends, you know, and absolutely not doing it, I will just say. Um, but, I, but I remember that being a prompt. <laughs> 
And um, anyway, so I, God started to prompt me um, as I got into this culture. And uh, there was one day that this guy called Lewis, he um, was one of the sales guys, and he had hurt his back, like severely hurt his back. And he came in one day, and he was walking like this, like literally this is how he walked into the office and he was just like, we could have a full conversation right now, you know, <laughs> by the time I get from here to the door. And um, anyway, and God prompted me immediately and said, pray for him, which I didn't do. Um, I, I was just like, God, I hear that prompt. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and, and I just thank you very much for the next one in advance. And he did prompt me, he prompted me the next day and the next day after that and on the third day I thought, gosh, like to not pray for him would be like, it would be complete disobedience. And you always know when you get prompt from God, well, I always know when I get a prompt from God because I get really hot, I sweat and my heart starts going a million miles an hour. And I'm like, this is definitely the Lord. <laughs> anyway, so I said to him, ah, oh, Lewis, um, can I take a look at your back? And he's like, oh, do you do backs? <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay, so do you have any training, like physiotherapy? And I was like, no, I, no, I don't. And I was like, just, just come over into the kitchen. And um, anyway, so we're in the kitchen, in the staff room, and, um, <laughs> and, and I said, do you mind if I just put my hand on your back where the pain is? And he said, oh, are you doing Reiki? And I said, no, Lewis, I'm doing something powerful. <laughs> and anyway, so I put, I put my hand on his back and I just said, peace. Peace come right now. Right now. Peace into this back. Healing into this back. And Lewis goes, there's a fire. <laughs> There's a fire, in, is, that, is that normal? There's a fire in my back. And I'm like, yeah, that's normal. Increase peace, God, increase peace. And he was like, this, the peace is, it's overwhelming, it's overwhelming. And he starts to like, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, the Christian walks past and I was like, Jermaine, I need a catcher. And he gets in there. <laughs> He's a Pentecostal boy, he was all over it. And uh, he gets in there and, and he's holding this guy. And I just wanna be so honest with you, in this moment, while I was praying for him, I was also praying, Lord, please let nobody else pass. Like, just be really honest. And as soon as I started praying that, all these people started coming past. And I was just like, okay, I need to let go of that. Let go of the fear of man. Um, while this guy looks like he's like needs an ambulance called for him. <laughs> anyway, and so, and so I got down next to him and, I, and he was like, what is this? What is this? And I said, Lewis, this is Jesus. This, this, this peace is Jesus. He is the person of peace and he wants to heal you and he wants to come into your life and he wants to walk with you every single day of your life and he died for you to be set free. He died for your soul to be free. And I just said to preach the gospel to him and it was, it was the most terrifying, like, like I was so not prepared for this to happen. <laughs> And um, anyway, his pain went from being a nine, nine and a half down to a two. And he walked back into the office completely normal um, with, with the, you know, the testimony of some, the weirdest thing in my life just happened to me out of reception. <laughs> um, and I don't even know what I'm up to. <laughs> oh yes, so this is something, if I'm in a secular environment, I never ask anyone if I can pray for them. Because then you've got to get over the hurdle of the religion thing and what do they believe and what do you believe and all this sort of stuff. I'd much prefer to introduce them to Jesus and then we'll deal with the rest later. Because once, because the thing is, salvation is a heart issue. Salvation is a heart issue, not a head issue. And anyway, so, so we had the most incredible conversations from there. Um, and, and, it, and Jermaine, my, my um, Christian friend, 
he said to me, God had prompted me every single day for the last three days to pray for him. And I was like, same. <laughs> and and um, anyway, and so, and so that, was, that was a beginning of a shift for us of, you know, bringing God into the workplace instead of trying to get people to go to church. Praise Jesus. Yeah. And um, anyway, so we, um, I've written something down here. Let's see what it says. Um, the gospel is not about getting people into church. It's about taking the good news out to them. I mean, I basically just said that. But um, the thing is, is that if we meet people with Jesus, we're meeting them in the deepest desire of their hearts. Yeah. And that is what they're hungry for. Like all these people at my work, why are they doing drugs and in the bathrooms and you know, getting drunk and turning up for work drunk? It's because they're, they're hungry, yeah. because they're trying to find something that's gonna fulfill them. Yeah. Anyway, so shortly after, shortly after the Lewis getting filled with the Holy Spirit thing, um, my friend, uh, from work invited a group of us out to a comedy club. Not my idea of fun, I will just say. And um, anyway, so a group of us went from work and um, it was like a seedy comedy club underground, no natural light, on a Friday night. And um, anyway, we're sitting there, not my kind of style of comedy. And, um, but you know, we were, we were sort of having fun. And anyway, this guy comes out onto the stage, and as soon as he comes out onto the stage, there is like a spirit of darkness on this guy. He, um, like his first joke was about like kicking a newborn baby or something. It was just like totally off. And, um, and he asks a question, he says, does anyone have a birthday in the house today? And then um, this poor guy, his 21st birthday it was, um, front row, he completely pulls this guy apart, embarrasses him in front of his family, and I was just like, oh, Jesus, like, get this guy off the stage, he is terrible. And um, anyway, his next, next question was, are there any Christians in the room? <laughs> Far out. <laughs> and honestly, my heart stopped. My heart totally stopped. I couldn't breathe. And I was just like, I can't say anything. I cannot say I'm a Christian. And the, the whole room was completely silent. And so he starts to bait the crowd. And he's like, oh, surely there's got to be one in here. In a room this size with 300 people, there's got to be one Christian. And it felt like I had a gun to my head and someone was saying, are you going to deny your faith? And so, in total panic, I leaned forward to my colleagues and I just said, I'm so sorry about this, guys. And the guy sitting next to me goes, Georgia, don't, he's gonna crucify you. <laughs> and I was like, that's kind of the point. And anyway, so I shut up my hand and I said, I'm a Christian. And he was like, ah, oh, well, it took you long enough to own up to it. And anyway, he starts to really like, you know, to, to really just dress down Christians. And then he says to me, he's like, so tell me, are you a Catholic or a Protestant? And I knew that this was, this was the gateway into his joke immediately. And so I just said, I just love Jesus. <laughs> and, um, and he was like, well, you know, you've got to be a Catholic or a Protestant. You can't just say you love Jesus. And... and, and like, like, and the room was silent, waiting for me to answer. And I just knew, I just knew, I, I cannot answer this question. I cannot answer this question. Guys, this is so embarrassing actually saying this right now. <laughs> but I just said the first thing that came to my head, which was, I don't know because I'm Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Pull the blonde foreigner card, 100%. And um, anyway, the whole room just erupted with laughter, absolutely erupted with laughter. And, and before I knew it, I had them all in the palm of my hand. And, and this guy's joke just completely, he, he said, he just, after a couple of interactions with me, he was just like, I can't do this joke, you're too positive. And, and just went on to the next joke. Anyway, 
At the end of the night, I had a line of people coming up to me to say that I was the favourite part of their night. And they're like, were you planted in the audience? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and, and all of my colleagues were like, she's with us. <laughs> she's with us. She's our friend. <laughs> And it, like, this is like best case scenario, guys. I mean, I've got lots of stories of things not working out, but this is one that did. And, and what was amazing about that is all I did was respond to a prompt. Responding to prompts. Like, God knows what he's doing. He knows who has open hearts. And like, what the conversation I had with my colleagues after that was seriously life-changing. And it led to my, my Muslim um, manager giving her heart to Jesus. Wow. And, and I tell you what, like, I mean, you know, it's that whole Romans 8, 28 thing, you know, what, what um, God can use everything, all things work together for good, exactly. Um, even if you feel humiliated or whatever it is, God will take that and he'll use it. He used that awful joke from that man, whatever the joke was, um, and he brought salvation out of that joke. Come on, Jesus. Um, by the time I, I left this job, I mean, you know, if anyone was ever sick in the office, the, you know, instead of getting a Panadol or something, they would say, you should go see the receptionist at the front. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, was, I was called into directors' meetings to talk to them about culture. I mean, it was, it was the most incredible experience. Um, and I'm not sharing this with you to be like, oh, I'm like a superstar Christian, look at me. I'm sharing this as a testimony of how basic it is to transform the world around you. Wow. Honestly, guys, it is so basic. And I was like in the lowest position in that company and there was a massive change. So it doesn't matter how low your position is or how much you hate your job, because can I just say, like that job was boring. Like, it was not intellectually stimulating. I was, you know, the many times it's like, oh, God, I'm in my 30s and I'm working alongside of people who just dropped out of high school. You know, like, it, it wasn't like, I wasn't coming alive, you know, by the work. But I thrived in that job because I went on mission. Because God had given me my work description, which, which was that Isaiah 61. I'm here, like, I'm here to be the light of the world to these people. I'm here to bring them the good news of the gospel. I'm here to come into the darkness and say, hey, there's another way to live. Let me introduce you to my friend Jesus. Now, there are a few things um, to keep in mind when you're going after um, living a you know, naturally supernatural life. One of them is that you're gonna miss prompts all the time, all the time. I reckon I miss prompts every single day, but it's, it's having a position of your heart where you say, thank you for that prompt, God, and I acknowledge that, and I thank you in advance for the next time. Yeah. Like, don't be hard on yourself. You are human, and us being human is what makes us need a saviour. And so that is a beautiful, beautiful part of us. So you don't need to like punish that part or try and suppress it or push it down. Just be like, this is me having a human moment. Um, the other thing is that there, <laughs> there will be moments when you are not the light of the world. Um, you'll be the very opposite. And literally, actually at this very time, Last Sunday, I, I had an experience like this. I was not the light of the world at all. I was picking my mum up from the airport and I hadn't seen her for two years. And, um, and this like parking shark van at the Launceston airport was like, you know, telling me that I couldn't be in the thing unless I could see the person. And then I saw my mum and she's like four foot 11 tiny. And I was like, I can see her, just a little blonde head bobbing along. And anyway, I got out of my car, walked about three paces to embrace her. And he was saying, as I was embracing my mum for the first time in two years, you can't leave your vehicle, da 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 da, all this sort of stuff. And I mean, you know, I was like this far away from my car, doors open, engine on, I mean, you know. And anyway, I wasn't gracious in that moment, guys. 
I ran after him and <laughs> I, <laughs> honestly, I ran after him and I told him to back off and that I hadn't seen my mum for two years whilst wearing a t-shirt that said, be kind. <laughs> the whole thing. I literally, I got into the car, I got into the car and I burst into tears and I was like, mum, I failed. I totally failed. <laughs> oh Lord. So look, the thing is, you carry the savior of the world inside of you. You are not the savior of the world. So just embrace all the humanity and the messiness that comes with um, <laughs> all these things. <laughs> Another thing is um, conviction versus condemnation. So when you're getting these prompts to pray for people or to reach out to them or to smile, or, you know, whatever it is, um, there are two voices inside of our head and they're very different voices. The voice of um, condemnation tells you that you should. The voice of condemnation is the voice of shame. But the voice of conviction is the voice that says, you can, this is, this is fun, you get to, you know. Um, I had a, an experience with co condemnation and conviction, and I, I really need to share this with this message. Um, I, was, I was in Melbourne on a break, I think in between first and second year um, from the ministry school, and I saw this woman coming out of the supermarket, and she was like hunched over and, you know, obviously had lots of ailments and I had this voice in my head that said you should pray for her and I was in a hurry and I was like oh I should pray for her and anyway so I went back and I said to her oh um can I pray for you and um and she was like get away from me like cursing me swearing at me all this sort of stuff and I turned away and that same voice was in my head and it said you shouldn't have prayed for her and I was like hold on, wait, you just told me I should pray for her and then you told me I shouldn't have prayed for her. And I'm like, what voice am I listening to right now? I was like, this is the voice of condemnation. And I realised as I then went about you know, my life how much I had the voice of condemnation in my head. And I decided, do you know what? I'm not going to pray for another person until I hear the voice of conviction. And that was an awkward decision when you're at ministry school. And so literally the whole ministry school is about going out into the community and praying for people and saying your testimonies and all that kind of stuff. And like, and I would just be like, don't have any testimonies, haven't prayed for anyone, <laughs> this is fun. And um, because every single time we'd go out and you know, do these things, I'd, I'd have the voice of condemnation, you should. You should be praying for that person. You shouldn't be, should be, shouldn't, you know, that whole thing. And I knew, I'm like, that voice makes me feel horrible. That is not God. And anyway, I, have, I was like on a day off or something and I saw this homeless person like off in the distance and I had this voice come into my head and it said, you get to pray for that person. <gasps> and I was like, oh my gosh, that's conviction. And I just ran over to them. I ran over to them. I mean, they probably thought I was a bit weird. Um, and I was just like, you know, is there anything that you need prayer for? And um, she was like a pregnant woman and she was like, oh, I just need some food. And I didn't have any money, but I went and bought her carrots. <laughs> it was the only thing I could afford. <laughs> I don't know, it's a bit weird. But that was the moment where I was like, this is the voice that I need to follow. But it took time, it took me time to drown out that, that voice of should and sort of starve it out of existence <laughs> in order to connect with the life empowering voice of the Holy Spirit, the conviction that says, I get to, I get to pray for that person. I get to partner with the Holy Spirit. You know, there is, it's, it's basically impossible to live a meaningless, pointless life when you've given your life to Jesus. Because it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, you are on mission in those circumstances. And we have one of the best examples of that in Paul. Like he, we have the New Testament because he was in jail, basically. Like he, like Philippians, oh my gosh. Like I have learnt to, to be content having much and having nothing. 
I have learned to be content. There is a, there is a place for us as Christmas, Christians to live above the fight of our circumstances. That no matter what we're in, no matter what we're in, we can thrive because we have a mission from God. A beautiful book of the Bible um, that just doesn't get enough credit is Philemon, Philemon, Philemon. But it, we're unsure. We're whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic. <laughs> right, right. And so um, there's this beautiful story in there of this um, of Paul meeting the slave who has done the wrong thing by his master and being imprisoned. But Paul actually knows the master, he's a believer, and he ends up sending the slave back to him, um, saved and set free. And he's like, don't even regard him as a slave anymore, for he is our brother. And, and this is like, if we have our eyes open, if we have our eyes open, when we're, we'll, we'll find those people. We'll find those people that God wants to encounter. And do you know what? You don't have to live another boring day of your life. Because even if you're standing in a queue, if you're, you know, whatever it is, like there is someone that God wants you to encounter. And sometimes the encounter is um, actually for you. Just reminded, so my friend Angela, sitting next to my nun just there, we met on the plane on the way from Melbourne to Devonport. And um, I had been in, the, it, I think, our, was our flight at like 4 p.m. or something like that? And um, my original flight was at seven o'clock in the morning. I'd just come out of detention for two weeks and my flight had been canceled to f the 4 p.m. flight. And the whole airport was in lockdown and only McDonald's was open, which, I mean, I'm not complaining about that. I love McDonald's. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, was, I was there for hours and hours and hours in the airport in total isolation, just being like, oh my gosh, this is the worst day ever. And then I sat next to Angela um, on the flight, and I tell you what, she was worth all those hours in the airport for me to catch that later flight, because um, she has been such a beautiful friend to me um, in Devonport. She lives in Devonport, she's Christian. Oh my gosh, like, talk about a kindred spirit. So sometimes when we reach out to people, we're the ones yeah. that actually are receiving the blessing, like we're reaching out for ourselves. So just a little ad lib um, thing there. So if you are in a job that is chipping away at your soul, it is time to go on mission. If you are a stay-at-home mum and you're deprived of adult conversation and it's slowly just, you know, it is time to go on mission. If you're a student and you're surrounded by people who are partying and doing drugs, um, it is time to go on mission. Um, if you're in a season of your life that feels meaningless and pointless, I've got the best news ever. It's time to go on mission. If you are in the best season of your life that you've ever been in, do you know what's gonna make it even better? <laughs> going on mission. There is nothing that disqualifies you from being Jesus' hands and feet to the world around you. There is nothing that disqualifies you from sharing the gospel. And I just want to really own the fact right now that I have a bubbly personality and um, I'm very outgoing. So the way I respond to prompts is going to be different to the way that you respond to prompts. And there might be people in this room who are naturally shy, introverted, you might not even really like people very much. God can still use you and he will still use you in your way. And you don't have to go outside of your personality in order for God to move through you. You just have to make yourself available. That's all it is. Like, I don't think Paul was actually like, you know, he wasn't a warm, fuzzy kind of guy. You know, I think that me and Paul may have clashed a bit. You know, but, but he, like, but God used him. God radically used him. If I can get the band um, to come back up, we're gonna just, we're just gonna bring this into close. Um, one of the most radical things that we can ever do 
is to love people. You know, I, I had a hunger in me to see signs and wonders and miracles, and I saw them. But nothing rocked my world more than the love of God, more than seeing how God loved people. And, you know, sometimes we have different callings in our lives, and sometimes we're just called to love one person, you know, and to pour our heart out for them in service. And, um, and I just want to um, take this opportunity just to, to acknowledge someone in this room who has ministered to me in the way that they love. I feel so emotional about this. <laughs> from the second week, from the second week of coming to this church, I saw this woman, and it is Sue, just here. Would you be able to stand up for me, Sue? From the second week that I came to this church, I have watched you, and I've watched the way that you love. And there are weeks where I've sat with tears in my eyes, watching the way that you love and the way that you care for the people God has put in your life. Can I tell you, I've, I've, I've actually never witnessed something that you carry. And I've had this word for you since that second week, but God was like, wait, wait, wait. And He wants you to know that He has seen all of the countless hours and weeks and months and years of your life that you have given to others. And that every moment, every single moment that nobody sees, He sees it. He sees your choice to love on a daily basis. And and you are famous in heaven. You are famous in heaven, Sue, for the way that you love, for the way that you love. And I saw a picture of you coming to heaven and there being this standing ovation waiting for you. God has seen every moment. He's seen every single moment. And I just really felt like today that if there was any part of you that felt like it hadn't been seen, He wanted to publicly tell you that He sees you. He sees you. If you all just want to like reach out your hands to Sue, we're just going to pray for her. If you're around her, if you just want to pop your hand on her. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for this general in the faith, God. I thank you for the way that you've made her. I thank you for the way that you see her. And God, I thank you for the way that she loves. Jesus, would we learn from her? Would we learn from her, God? I just pray that if there are any any places in her life where she feels like the load is too heavy, would you just bring provision right now? Would you bring provision right now? Jesus. Would there be an increase of the Holy Spirit in her home? An increase of dreams in the night? increase of encounters with you, Father. Yeah, thank you, God. Yeah, thank you for the great witness that she is to us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Guys, No one is disqualified. It doesn't matter how isolated you feel. It doesn't matter where your life is. We're all called to this mission. And it might look like, you know, um, witnessing to a group of 300 people who are in a comedy club. Or it might look like loving one person really, really well. 
gonna gonna ask you guys to be brave. And um, if you want an upgrade today, if you want to receive an upgrade to hearing these prompts, encourage to go with it. I'm gonna ask you to stand right now. I am standing. <laughs> I need an upgrade. get to be your hands and feet, that we get to partner with you. And thank you, God, that just because you're sovereign, it doesn't mean we can't partner with you. For every single person in this room, I just ask for the volume to be turned up, the volume to be turned up in hearing your voice. surrounding them and I thank you that that they are on mission for you father to bring light and color into this into this world around us yeah, Jesus. Jesus courage oh, thank you father for courage in this room for an increase of courage in every person's life and an increase of joy and of hope. Oh, we get to know you, God, in a way that we've never known you before.